everyone, my name is Lee Perry and thank you so much for tuning in. I am here with my peers who I am super intimidated by because every time I'm around them, they teach me so much. And as a hardcore environmentalist, I will say that what we're gonna talk about today is directly tied to our quality of life and all of you environmentalists out there should really tune in on how this impacts the movement. So we will start over here with my friend Hannah. Hannah, introduce yourself and then we'll talk a little bit about why we're here. Okay, hello, I'm Hannah. I am a very proud Florida woman, even though I'm a transplant to Orlando as of last December, so almost a year. And I am a biker and a pedestrian and a very proud one at that. And I'm also part of Orlando Bike Coalition. All right. How about you, Austin? And Yimby. Yes, uh, my name is Austin Valley. I am born and raised here in Central Florida. Uh, I do a, a lot of stuff in my free time. Uh, one of those things is uh, I am one of the co-leads of Orlando Yimby, which I don't think folks here know stands for Yes in My Backyard. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we're an organization that organizes for housing. We're, we're pro-housing, we're pro-people, mm -hmm. and so that's what we spend our time doing. There, there's more to me than just that, uh, but that's what we'll focus on here today. Cool. Great, I think you're awesome. Hi, I'm Naki McMullen. I am an urban planning student. I'm a passionate cyclist and pedestrian, and I'm co-founder of Orlando Yimby with this, this dude. And I'm also a member of Orlando Bike Coalition, and we advocate for safe biking infrastructure. And of course, with Orlando Yimby, we're all about affordable housing. And also, I'm wearing a Fahrenheit 451 shirt because we're burning books in Virginia, and that's not right, personally, in my opinion. Okay, so we're gonna write that down because we gotta dive into that. <laughs> yeah, I was not aware of that. <laughs> okay, so let me just talk a little bit about why I personally am interested in this movement, right? So I get into my lane where I'm like into reading a whole bunch about climate change, reading a whole bunch about deforestation and all the issues that impact my quality of life and all the things that I'm the most passionate about. You know, I'm really against uh, roadkill. I think that's my biggest why of why I wake up in the morning is that I'm, I have so much anxiety every time I see roadkill and nobody talks about it, right? And so it just, it just digs inside of me and I wanna dive into why we have these problems. Well, as you start to unpack a lot of the things that you know, even you are passionate about, you start to realize that everything's connected, right? And that's when I found the Orlando Yimby team because I realized that things like affordable housing, exclusionary zoning, which if that sounds like you don't really know what that means, I didn't know what it meant like not even six months ago. If you don't know about parking minimums or you don't know about transit, that's okay because it's all connected and it definitely has something to do with something that's impacting your quality of life right now. So let's talk a little bit about what is Orlando Yimby. Sure, uh, so Orlando Yimby, like I said, stands for yes in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And we advocate for um, abundant housing. Uh, we feel as though there is an attitude out there. We position ourselves against what we call the NIMBYs, which is folks who say, Yes, I support housing, but not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Put it over there, we don't want it. We are a group that has a, a proactive uh, position on that. And we say that yes, we need housing, we see the need for housing, yeah. and we do want it in our backyard. And so we advocate for policies to that end. Mm -hmm. Yes, we welcome more neighbors. We want to have, we welcome everyone. We want walkable communities. We want safe cycling infrastructure. We want transit. We want streets for people, not cars. Mm -hmm. It, I would add, too, because I know we'll get into this, I know this is important for you as well, Lee, uh, there are a lot of instances where there's maybe housing that's proposed 40 miles from downtown, mm -hmm. and what feels sometimes like it's rural communities or, or semi-rural communities. That's not what we mean, and I'm sure we can dive more into that, but we're talking about, to Naki's point, is dense infill housing that is near to opportunity, that is near to transit, that is near to job centers, and so um, that's primarily what we, what we focus on. Okay, well, let me just make one thing clear. Okay. Okay, it is uh, way past our uh, job time. So our hats of whatever roles that we play are off and we're just <laughs> everyday citizens right now. So I just wanted to make sure that we put a stamp on that because you might know me and some of these other faces affiliated with other organizations, but today we're just us. So I wanna just preface that. Um, so, okay, let's think about why Orlando Yimby even started, mm. okay? 
there has to be a need. You didn't just come up with having a group here out of the blue. There must be a problem, right? Well, I'll let Naki speak to the problem, but I'll, I can give the origin story of how this all started. Okay. Uh, we started in around May of, of this year, May of 2021. And for me, there was a lot going on in my life. I just had, my wife and I just had a baby. Uh, you might recall there was an attempt at an insurrection on the Capitol. And I was in this moment in my life where I thought, there is a need for me to do something in my community. I have to contribute in some way. Uh, that was some, something that was sort of nagging at me. And this was a need that I just saw in the community. I think a lot of us saw it. It's on the front page of every newspaper all the time. And so I just wanted to volunteer. So I reached out to a lot of people who are involved in the community and asked, how can I get involved? How can I volunteer? Is there a group that does something around building more housing and solving that problem? Everyone said, no, that group doesn't exist. That group doesn't exist. I don't know if something like that here. Until I asked Naki, who I just knew from Twitter, and Naki said, no, it doesn't exist, uh, but we should start it. And I'll let Naki sort of take it from there, but but uh, Naki was the inspiration for me to actually uh, go do it. Yeah, honestly, the original inspiration was the Orlando Executive Airport, which is a huge waste of space. It pre prevents buildings from being over 400 feet downtown. Uh, it's only utilized by rich, private, wealthy CEOs. It's not even open to the public. And this is miles of space that could be used for affordable housing. So I was tweeting about it and complaining, and Austin's like, yo, I agree. We need to fix this. And lo and behold, we started Orlando Yemby, and now we're making a change to incorporate spark growth values into our development. Mm -hmm. I never knew that. That's fascinating. I always thought that that airport was like a place where people could train to get hours for their pilot license. I did not realize that it was that exclusive and that shut off from the general public. It's for like private jets. And I had no Probably. idea how limiting it was to urban design. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I live in Colonial Town North and we're getting a new apartment complex on Colonial and Fern Creek between Fern Creek and Altaloma. And I'm so excited, you know, because the whole point is yes in my backyard. So I'm like, bring the people, make it yes. 15 stories. I mean, give me 30, like give me 30 stories. I don't care. And make half of it affordable. And the staff, I emailed the Orlando staff. <laughs> they were like, who is this person? And <laughs> Like, normally they don't get that reaction yeah, to housing. Yeah. Um, and, and they said, no, it, it's going to be seven stories, which is like the best that they can do because of the executive airport, mm -hmm. which is super frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's chat a little bit about Orlando Yimby and what is it's becoming and what the goal is ultimately, because you guys have kind of four tiers of your mission statement. Sure. So as far as the, the, the policies go, um, uh, well, I'll speak to our strategy. And our strategy, uh, there's, there's, there's three pillars to our strategy, and then get into the policies. But mm -hmm. the three pillars that we think about are, uh, one, proactive policymaking. There are a lot of fights around housing. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is make sure there's fewer fights. Because there's fights around housing because there's points of friction in the policymaking process mm -hmm. where you need an approval for this, you need a variance for this, you need 27 community meetings to build some housing for folks who need it. And so there's ways to get ahead of that, to change those base rules, and these are cities who are doing this all across the U.S., so that the default state is a higher level of housing and density than there is today. So that's mm -hmm. one, is this proactive piece, and we're working with the county and the city and on stuff like that. The second is reactive. So sometimes there will be uh, projects that are proposed and neighbors will come out and they will fight those projects, which is their prerogative. It's their First Amendment right and it's our First Amendment right to come into that and give our perspective, which is that we do need more housing here. And so we are sometimes showing up in those instances to make clear to those elected officials that um, you are hearing loud voices right now. You should know that there are other voices mm -hmm. who think opposite. And also there are other voices who are not at the table at all because they're working and it's 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. right? right? or uh, they don't know that that is an opportunity of housing for them. And so why would they show up if they don't even realize that it's something that they could have because it's going to be built in three years and right now they, they don't afford to live in the neighborhood and so they're not sent a notice about it. Yeah. Right, so we're here to provide that perspective on that. And then the third is community building. Right, We like to meet like-minded folks. We have happy hours, mixers, um, uh, guest speakers to come in. I know Hannah set up some of those. And so those are the ways that we think about affecting change in the community mm -hmm. and how, you know, which one we're, we're focused on in any given day. We are a 100% volunteer organization, so we have to be good stewards of our resources and of our volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of depends on what the, what the question of the day is. 
So, you know, we have elected officials that, you know, many times we elect and we expect them to kind of know what's best for our community and make the right decision. But not everybody knows everything all the time. So it's really good to have groups that are working together, bringing ideas together that they're passionate about, especially things that are so interconnected like this, and bringing them and kind of lobbying mm -hmm. unpaid uh, mm -hmm. as a volunteer group, lobbying commissioners at every level, trying to engage them in these conversations to educate them because sometimes our elected officials don't know everything so they need to be educated by grassroots organizations like this so maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, some of your goals in educating our elected officials and and where you see this going yeah, yeah we have education is a strong part of our platform uh, we're big and write in opinion editorials to the paper, so the policymakers are sure to read our thoughts on the matters. We do webinars and presentations on relevant <laughs> matters. Uh, I myself did a webinar on environmental justice and how Orlando is not a good example of environmental justice. For example, I-4, which went through the historically black neighborhoods and tore them down. Mm -hmm. which is a perfect example of environmental injustice. So we want to educate people who might not be aware of the problems of our community, and so they become aware, and then they better, better understand where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk about something that I know this lady right here is very passionate about. So we're going to go from the bottom back up to affordable housing. So let's talk about um, parking minimums, right? So this is something <laughs> that in my head, I've never heard about before. I did not realize that when new developments come in, there's a minimum requirement of how much parking they can have. How does that affect everyone else in our quality of life? Yeah, so I appreciate that because I do love parking. But you before I get into that, yeah, I love parking. I love hates parking. Yeah, I do hate parking. I love completely changing parking regulations. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into that, I want to acknowledge something unique. Maybe it's not even unique to Orlando, but maybe it's unique to the conversation that we don't always address, is the fact that renters are not perceived as part of the conversation mm -hmm. in housing. And mm -hmm. they don't always get notifications when we do have some sort of community meeting for a new development. The renters don't get the notifications, the homeowners do. And that has mm -hmm. a huge part in who shows up. Yeah. You know, because people who are homeowners have a financial stake in housing scarcity mm -hmm. because it increases the values of their homes to some degree, which is totally valid. But renters are here yeah. and in Orlando, they make up a significant portion, me, you know, of of mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. residency and our constituency. And we need to make sure they're included in that conversation, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, just to add on to that, th the latest sense of data that I saw on this was that in Orlando, city of Orlando, 65% of residents are renters. So it's yeah. the majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 65% of the city council is not renters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 65% of voters are not renters. And right? if there were options, how many more renters would there be? That's no. right. Right. That's right. That's so right. I think that's important to acknowledge is the way we treat one renters that's systematically and then also socially in the way we interact with them and who gets to provide the input. Um, but then going into parking. So this is something really interesting that I have only learned about in the past <coughs> two years probably. And um, I got into new urbanism stuff because my brother is a big, he's a voracious reader, and he recommended Suburban Nation. If you haven't read it, you should. And it totally changed my life. I took a class in my last semester of college for transportation planning, learned about parking, learned about urban freight, and like blew my mind. And if you look at on a map, of how much surface area parking takes. It's astounding. Mm -hmm. It's astounding. And and you think about the way that we arrived at the conclusions of parking minimums. So basically, I guess for context, sorry, I always do this. I always assume people know exactly what I'm talking What's about. Wrong with it? So parking minimums are basically an arbitrary way that the city and municipalities require a certain amount of parking per trip or per dwelling unit or per amount of people that you're expecting to come to your commercial establishment um, to make sure that enough people come, basically. And so they use something called the Strip Generation Manual that's updated, I, I forget how often, uh, it's usually by uh, Florida Department of Transportation, but it focuses on motorists and it focuses on cars. And so um, 
you know, when we talk about attracting people to a commercial destination, it's assumed that they're going to be transient, that they don't live there. It's assumed that they're coming from somewhere else in which they need to drive. And so they need to build, for example, usually the typical one is two parking spaces per dwelling unit, which is like a bedroom. Mm -hmm. And in downtown Orlando, full credit to downtown Orlando, it's a minimum of one with a maximum of two. Parking and minimums are the most common. Maximums are not super common. And more and more cities are just eliminating them altogether because parking minimums are actually one of those few examples where the market, the free market really can dictate very well what's going to be used and what's not going to be used because parking costs between fifteen and $25,000 per space because of how expensive and valuable land is in our downtown areas that you just leave a spot open, you know, that's 12 feet by six feet wide costs a lot of money. It costs around fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars, and for renters, it costs I think the number is two hundred twenty-five dollars more per month mm -hmm. just for the parking space. So not only is it extremely expensive, but not everybody uses it. So people mm -hmm. who people like Naki who don't own a car end up paying mm -hmm. for it and unfairly subsidizing it. I mean, but there's sometimes there's parking lots that are completely empty just because yeah. the business hours of those companies like churches. Uh, yeah, stay within a certain cap and then they are just empty every other time during the week. Like, what's the deal with that? Why do they have parking minimums if they're closed half the week? Yeah, I mean, one of the weird, there, there are so many opportunities for fixing the issues with parking. Um, among them includes opportunities for things like shared parking where you can say, okay, you know, between the hours of nine and five, for example, nobody's gonna be here or everyone's gonna be here. And outside of those hours, an office can provide parking for a bar next yeah. to it. You know, which just makes sense. Yeah. Why does bars have parking? Where it's like we're encouraging yeah. people to drive. <laughs> no, yeah. you're, so, I mean, right. It's, it's exactly those things. And it's because it's so arbitrary and it's a broad kind of, okay, every establishment that attracts X amount of people needs to have Y amount of parking. Mm -hmm. And it's a waste of space. It's very expensive. And it relates to affordable housing because people make the argument all the time that that spot could be mm -hmm. a housing unit. And, mm -hmm. and it's a valid it's a very yep. valid argument. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I've been carless for 10 years in Orlando, and it is illegal for me to go out and buy a condo with no parking attached. It doesn't exist in Orlando. I gotta pay 20 to 30 percent more for the asking price for a condo just because parking is attached, because that's laws. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing, I, Hannah, you made a great point, which is that that parking spot or that parking lot could be mm -hmm. affordable units. It, it could also be market rate units. Yeah. We, one thing that I think is important to remember, and I, I, I've talked about this before, um, and this is a, I consider myself a progressive person, something that I think we need to grapple with in our, in our worldview is that the vast majority of revenue raised mm -hmm. in municipalities, cities and counties, is through property taxes. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you fund services, the way that you fund things like affordable housing and transit is by and large through property taxes. Mm -hmm. The property taxes collected on a parking spot is magnitudes less mm -hmm. than, the, than, the, than the property taxes collected on a market rate unit or on a business mm -hmm. or on any sort of commerce. That actually generates anything. That's yeah. right, and so when we constrict the amount of uh, even market rate housing, or we can constrict the amount of commerce or retail that's going on because we're ceding this prime real estate over to incredibly unproductive uses, mm -hmm. it is severely constraining how much revenue we're raising as a municipality, and therefore it's undercutting the vision that I think a lot of progressives have of more ser of more services, higher mm -hmm. quality services, providing transit and housing. We're not allowing ourselves to raise enough money to do those by insisting on very unproductive uses of land like parking lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I think you know that's one of those things with parking where, okay, fine have your parking, but at least make people pay for it who are using it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not really fine have your parking. In an ideal world, <laughs> we eliminate parking minimums because, like I said, it's, you know, I, I'm the same. I'm pretty progressive, and that generally is assumed to go with a lot of government regulation, but parking is one of those things where the free market can dictate really well. Yeah, I mean, you could do an assessment and figure out where it would make sense to have shared parking versus making a minimum for whatever, because everything's siloed. Everybody's looking right. at every single approval of every single mm -hmm. development as a case-by-case -case scenario, and not looking at a comprehensive, even though we have a comprehensive plan, 
not a comprehensive overlook of like, how are these people gonna get to work? Can we give them other options? Because don't forget, the first form of transit was pedestrian transit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a, a word like pedestrianists where you're like racist, but against pedestrians. No. I don't know no. if there's like a way to like show like, switch, which I would, say, well, I would say, I would say, I would say that that is a good segue to exclusionary zoning, which is the next tier, right? Because exclusionary zoning is something that I am just now learning about. Yeah. And now that we're going through our comprehensive planning process here in Orange County, I'm realizing that there's a lot of systemic issues that we're having to clean up now through reassessing how our zoning is currently put into place. And when that nimbyism comes in, I don't wanna blame the people who have lived here for generations who have had their community be a certain way and then try to say that you know, racist themes have been, you know, uh, put into their community through the way that things were zoned and everything because there are opportunities to change. It's just that there's certain narratives that are being sold to us as we're looking at our community's development that we might think, uh, we're being fear-mongered in many cases when we're looking at how different parts of our community could be rezoned. And let's, let's touch on exclusionary zoning and how that impacts people in rural communities, people in urban communities, and let's talk about examples of communities that are doing it right. Sure. Well, just to define it, first of all, exclusionary zoning is a, even back up further. Uh, zoning mm -hmm. is when a municipality, a city or a county says what type of building can occur on, on a certain plot of land. And so uh, if you've ever played SimCity, this is zoning, right? You can you build residential here, you build commercial here, industrial mm -hmm. here. There's no mixed use in SimCity, at least the SimCity yeah. that I played you know many, many years Let's ago. Let's petition. You're yeah. right. <laughs> I played a lot, I think, decades ago. But in, in any event, it's, it's always split. Austin has a second life. <laughs> I, I guess so. Like a whole friendship. So exclusionary zoning, specifically in a, in a residential setting, is essentially a way of saying that only a particular type of housing and, and only a single family home can be built on this plot of land. The vast vast, vast, vast majority of land in Orange County and Orlando is exclusionary. You can only build a single family home there. A single family home is the most expensive form of housing. And so it should not be a shock. Everyone looks around and says, we're only gonna let you build the most expensive form of housing Oh no, why is housing so expensive? Mm -hmm. It's because we mandated that you build the most expensive form of housing, and we did that through exclusionary zoning. So that's the sort of definition of what it is. That's a big piece of what we, we think about. Um, and everyone wonders why Orlando feels so big. That's right. And it's because so much of the land is, okay, you here, you here, you here, instead of, let's all be right here, you know? And it, it wastes a lot, or it's not necessarily a waste, but it takes a lot more land to provide for the same amount of people. It takes as a lot it would. more water as well. It makes all the land. Water, Lands. pavement, so schools. I want to chat about that, right? Because emergency services. So let's yeah. just pretend this is our county. I don't know if you guys can see that, right? Where I have the central circle here is kind of the more urban corridor. This is where there's transit. This is where there's a lot of economic opportunities. This is where uh, people are building housing up right so infill then we have kind of this middle area here where we have maybe duplexes people do have to commute but there's still access to public transit but then the outer rim is supposed to be right more rural areas people that have maybe 10 acres per yeah, lot and people who are you know riding to work on horseback and things like that you know because those people still exist and they still totally are valid However, I feel like through the years, with different things like transit, which we'll get into, there have been ways where we have completely segregated different communities, and then still to this day, because we've compartmentalized how we've been voting on certain developments, we've been approving things like single-family homes, tons of urban sprawl way outside of that urban corridor where we would ever see a hope, a little tiny drop of transit. And we've also been doing things like single family homes in the areas where we could really benefit the most from infill. So let's chat about that. We have lots of thoughts. Snucky, you wanna go first? <laughs> yeah, so infill has so many positive benefits. Tax benefits. 
Um, so suburban sprawl is often considered a Ponzi scheme because you got to keep growing mm -hmm. to pay the cost of the infrastructure yes. and it never ends. So infill development is sustainable and it's also financially smart because you're utilizing infrastructure that already exists. So that's why we're the biggest supporters of in infill. Not only does it support walkable communities, but it also is financially beneficial for the city and the taxpayers as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wish there was a, um, a, a more direct connection between, that was more apparent to more people. From my perspective, when, and this happened uh, about a year ago, maybe two years ago now, where there was supposed to be um, uh, a large high rise built right, right downtown, right in the middle of downtown, uh, close to Lake Yola Park. And for oh, yeah. uh, complex reasons that we, won't need, we don't need to get into, it was blocked. They, they said, we're not gonna build this here, we're not gonna put this here. From my perspective, the people who should be most furious about that are out in rural Orange County. Or yes. um, that, or in rural, even rural Seminole County, Lake County, because yeah. when they block those 600 units, you know where they're coming to the Econ River. Yeah. Right. Way These, outside of that urban corridor area. That's right. And so w we need those folks to recognize that when the downtown core does not do their part in providing housing, mm -hmm. providing robust transit so folks can get around there, they are paying the cost. Well, let me just preface that when a new development, when an applicant is filing for either a rezoning or, you know, a you know, planned development and they want to do a community meeting, we're only required to send out mailers to people who are like less than a mile away from where that development is taking place. 300 feet. 300 feet is the minimum. <laughs> Usually okay. we do five to 500 feet to 1,000, so we which is still a fifth of a mile. We could literally wow. invite like half of an HOA to come out to a community meeting, but not the other half, even though they're all using the same roads, they're all using the same fire rescue departments, they're all using Usually we're pretty good about the HOA stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not really bringing the people to the table who are now living way outside of this area who their roads are getting more congested. They are seeing uh, way more single family housing, like a sea of housing. So now all their wildlife is being displaced. Uh, that nice, quiet, rural lifestyle that they thought they would have. They're getting tiki tacky houses built all around them. And now they are just victims of a system that didn't bring them to the table when all those decisions were being made. Yeah. yeah and you know, Austin hit it right on the head with Lake, Polk, and Seminole County because it's it's really bizarre, like you said, where there's that disconnect because I think so many people, all the time, I honestly feel like probably almost every day, people are saying, wow, it's so crazy how Lakeland is growing yeah. or, yeah. or yeah. Davenport yeah. or Sebring, you know, very small, dilapidated towns. Where are these people Out work? in the middle of Polk County oh. and they're driving to downtown Orlando. Yeah. yeah. And then our solution is build another lane yeah. on I-4. Yeah. And we say, well, that's where all that's where it is when it's affordable, and nobody connects. Yeah. That more housing, more densely, and in more intensely built areas like downtown would prevent all this commute. And it's you know it's okay to have those towns explode. You know that's I mean that's that's great for them to have more people. But then they need to have commercial. You know they can't yeah. they can't just have houses on the Lake County line. You can't just have houses. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. You hit it right on the head with that disconnect. People don't they don't do it. And <laughs> and I think there is supposed to be a formula, and maybe you guys can talk about this. We're supposed to be asking the applicants, these usually very big developers who have been doing this for generations, who feel safe and comfortable in their space of building single family homes because they know they can get it financed and they know they can make a return on their investment. We're supposed to be asking them, well, what are you going to do for the community? Are you going to put in uh, mixed use bike paths? Are you going to be amenitizing your uh, retention ponds? Where are these people going to work? Is there an overarching comprehensive plan to really analyze 
what the quality of life, or is it just a Ponzi scheme where like, let's get rich quick before Florida's underwater? <laughs> like what's going on? Yeah, so for me personally, like Orlando industry is predominantly low paying tourism jobs. We cannot sustain this economy much longer with these housing prices. Yep. Someone making minimum wage cannot pay $300,000 for a house, like you said. So, like Austin, for example. Well, I mean, I think there are, where are industries, where we have industries that have those you know, more higher paying wages tend to be downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a, a good cluster near UCF, near, near the UCF area. Um, near that UCF area, that's an interesting area where um, it's very looks very suburban, right? But there's a lot of growth for students uh, as well. But that's continuing to spread further and further and further out into rural Orange County. And so there's probably an opportunity there to do some level of density near the campus for students and near that um, um, uh, that cluster of employment there. I mean, it's, it's slipping on me. Uh, the military industrial complex. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. What's um, like? There's like Lockheed. Yeah. Siemens and various well, modeling there's a name. simulations. Yeah, the, the, the simulation business. So they are or, or near downtown, right? I mean, obviously downtown is, I think, where where the biggest focus should be, though. Um, the Colonial Plaza plan. Aren't you working on that? Uh, um, yeah. So there's opportunities, I think, near Fashion Square Mall redevelopment to put some more walkability there. All yeah, that them for 15 stories too. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Could you give it to me? I mean, in general, if you go downtown, you you walk a, a mile. Well, don't walk because it's not safe <laughs> to do yeah. that right there. But we'll if you, talk about transit next. If you go a mile and a half from downtown, you quickly find yourself in neighborhoods that you can only build a single-family home. Um, I live in a neighborhood where you're only allowed to live in a single-family home. Mm -hmm. And again, that's that's the same as what we're, we're talking about here. Is you know, I, every single-family home that isn't a fourplex mm -hmm. is three people that have to commute into the city. Uh, or three people who now we have to build single family homes over conservation areas, mm -hmm. or three people who we're telling aren't welcome to our city. And yeah. Yeah. you know, I think we're an inclusive city and we want to welcome people, mm -hmm. but our housing does not reflect that all the time. And keep in mind, you know, with those three people as well comes emissions from cars and mm -hmm. you know deforestation and yeah, it's, yeah. it's and and that's fine if you know I, I think I conversely live in a neighborhood that is a great example of mixed housing types where I live in Clunotan North and I live in a single family house that I rent with four people <laughs> to afford rent. But I have duplexes, triplexes, I have a section of townhomes all near me and then also like really beautiful big houses. And I think that diversity in housing options makes the neighborhood so much more rich. Of course, yeah. mm -hmm. So much more rich. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think as environmentalists, we need to acknowledge one thing and ask another thing. And what right. we need to acknowledge, excuse me, I, I use this quote a lot, some of you guys have maybe heard this before, but um, housing is not procreation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Building 100 units does not create 100 people. Right. Yeah, they're already We there. have to acknowledge that those people exist, and now we have to ask ourselves, where should they live? Yeah. And our answers are here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. In the city, near the jobs, near the transit, or far from the city. Or two counties away. That's right. Those are our only options. We cannot wish these people away. Mm -hmm. And so our decisions need to uh, grapple with that fact, which sometimes I think for some folks is difficult to grapple with, mm -hmm. but it's a fact and we have to acknowledge it and then we have to make some difficult decisions based on that fact. Yeah. Well, before we talk about transit, because I know we're all passionate about transit and I can't wait. Um, we, we do need to talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about, you said, there are people who are already here who need housing. Mm -hmm. But there's also 1,500 people moving here every single week. That's right. I feel, and I haven't really read any strong articles that have correlated the two, but I feel like all the climate devastation that's happening globally and across our country, specifically, are, are leading a lot of people to move into different places, like all the wildfires that happened out in California. Yeah. Where are people who are accustomed to a certain climate going to go? Well, they're not going to Massachusetts and they're not going to New York. They're going to probably go to Florida because it's the closest thing to what they probably had in California. Um, that's a far stretch because there's still a lot of data that needs to be collected. What I think is that when we look at what is already a need 
And then we're trying to project future need, right? We're trying to develop comprehensive plans for the future. We're also preempted at the state in many occasions where we can't set standards that will last years and years and years in time because we already had a comprehensive plan that was made 30 years ago that applicants who came in who wanted to do developments like single family housing like a sea of single family housing way outside the urban corridor started to slowly apply for variances and kind of change and piecemeal our comprehensive plan to make their profit margins work right and that has ultimately caused a lot of problems where people are having to commute 45 minutes minimum just to get to some place where they can make somewhat of a decent wage if at all so I think that's a good segue into transit. A quick think? correction on that, okay. although I'm not an expert. The code is not preempted from an update. And we do have to update a comprehensive yeah. plan every couple of years. The problem is the code is just never updated. And the state does preempt a lot of stuff. Like, for example, we can't get any breathing room to be like, can we just do a building moratorium for a year? That's what I was saying, is that yeah. we're preempted from be being able to do things like that to say, okay, hold on, Let's we are focus. veering way too far off of our comprehensive plan. Right. Let's go ahead and do a building moratorium. We're preempted from doing that. Yes, exactly. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so let's chit chat a little bit about your favorite thing, transit. <laughs> so I'm a long suffering Lynx rider. I've been <laughs> dependent on transit and biking for decades. And it's not great. There's a lot of problems. One of the predominant problems is Mirrors Transportation. They provide all the private theme park shuttles for not only theme parks, but all the hotels. Mirrors. They have 1,200 vehicles. Lynx has 300 vehicles. We have a segregated wow. transportation system. Tourists get the nice new buses. Workers for Disney and Universal get horrible service. They get nothing. If the demand for the tourist was put on Lynx like it should, then everyone would benefit. So transit in Orlando needs a significant overhaul and we really need to stop subsidizing private interest. One of the ways we can do this is by changing the transit development tax so we can use it for transit and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And more so on transit. So we got SunRail, <laughs> which runs five days a week. It doesn't run on weekends. That is pretty much useless for our economy, which is based around the hospitality industry, which is all day. It's not a nine to five jobs downtown. So we have a transportation system based upon economy, which we don't have. Mm. We need a serious overhaul and we need leaders that care about the workers. Right now we have a transportation system that we own, people who cannot afford cars only use. We do not have a transit system that is an actual alternative to driving, which is the problem. You can, if you don't have to buy a car, that's 20 to 30% of your monthly income in your pocket. I've been working from home, haven't driven in years, and that is how I've afforded to keep up with 20% rent increases. So removing transportation costs is honestly the best way besides reducing rent costs for pinning money back in the consumer's pockets. Now I must just add one thing. Orlando is the most dangerous city for bikers and for pedestrians. So let's just preface that because we are basically putting people who can't afford cars and can't afford transit even in very dangerous, life-threatening situations that they have to depend on if they want any type of quality of life and, and workforce development or any, any access to anything. And so maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that because you're both mm -hmm. huge bikers. Mm -hmm. What? How have you felt? Have you felt safe riding around? No. And um, to note as well with SunRail, 
you know, not only is it limiting with the commuter rail, but SunRail actually is such a great opportunity with tourism to open up certain areas to tourism. For example, in Volusia County, um, DeBerry and DeLand, mm -hmm. SunRail is supposed to expand to DeLand, and it's already in DeBerry, and DeBerry has done an amazing job in Volusia County and the MPOs, done an amazing job investing in the East Central Florida Regional Bike Trail, mm -hmm. as well as the Spring to Spring Trail. And in my ideal, like, multimodal heaven on dream, I could bike to the SunRail from my house in downtown Orlando, take the SunRail to DeBerry, and ride on the East Central Florida Regional Trail. Mm -hmm. And I'd probably spend a good bit of money at lunch in all mm -hmm. those areas, you know, on the SunRail and doing all these things that are ecotourism. There are so many more ways in addition to the TDT and amusement parks that we can attract tourism. And Seminole County, for example, does an amazing job of calling themselves the real Florida. Florida State Parks call themselves the real Florida. And when you ride on a bike trail out there, you do feel like you're in the real Florida. You see the cypress domes, you see the live oak hammocks, you see the gators, you mm -hmm. see the birds, you see the wetlands, and you feel like, wow, this is amazing. It's pretty unfortunate we paved paradise and put up a parking lot, am I right? I mean. <laughs> Seriously, that, that song had it right, but yes, I feel really unsafe biking. I have a million lights. I have a car horn on my bike because I've almost been hit by a car going straight on. And I figure maybe if I make a car horn sound, they'll actually look up because it's not that they can't see me. It's that they're not looking. Mm -hmm. And I wear a bright yellow vest. I commute to work by bike usually. And I do it because I hate driving so much. I take residential roads that are bricks. Yeah. They're really bumpy. Mm -hmm. And I frankly risk my life because I don't like driving. These people age zero to 40, most likely cause of death is driving anyway. So I think I think also on a whole other note, we, we've normalized driving to such an extent, people have no idea how dangerous it is. In addition to actually dying or getting seriously injured, driving takes off so many years of your life through the stress of sitting there white knuckled mm -hmm. for you know 30 minutes a day. It takes time away from family. It takes time away from productively reading or anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the options for quality of life when you don't have to be driving, particularly because you have to pay attention mm -hmm. and worry about your own safety and the people who are in your car's safety. And drunk driving, like Naki brought up earlier, you know, all these things, the way we center our cities and our communities around driving kills community. People have to work yeah. so much harder to build a community. You know, you have to go out of your way to bike all the time. You kind of risk your life and find other people who also and meet people. <laughs> go out of their way to bike. You and know? that's the thing is that I don't think people realize what life could be like, how much less no. stress you would have if you didn't have to have a car yeah. because it helps you actually uh, go and travel outside of your normal bubble because you don't have to worry about parking. You can just kind of grab a little snack, get your little bag, jump on a train, sit, work a little bit, and then get off and just pop around, see some sights, get back on the train. You don't have to worry about, oh my God, I parked 45 minutes away. Now I got to walk all the way back just to get my car, even though I was really enjoying uh, seeing the sights over here. Instead, you can just be like, oh, wait, okay, so I got off at the train station like two or three stops ago, I'll just dra grab a little train that I know is coming every, or excuse me, a little bus that's coming every 15 minutes and then just catch the train over there. Yeah. It just re releases you from that stress and allows you to be a little bit more of a an adventurer in your own community. Yeah, yep. and I mean, even something small in terms of driving in community is when you're driving, and you see somebody passing you, you don't nod. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little thing when you're walking, when you're biking and you see somebody else walking or biking, hi. you nod, you no. say hi. You know, it's those little things that build community that you totally miss mm -hmm. when you're in a car, in addition to the road rage yeah. and <laughs> the stress and all these other things and mm -hmm. the safety issues, you know, so it's just those little things. Well, and, and what's the point of a city? Yeah. For thousands of years, the point of a city has been there's travelers around the land and you come to a city and you stop and you perform commerce mm -hmm. and people live there and they move around. The point of a city, the point of a neighborhood is to get there and stop there and stay there. Mm -hmm. So why then are we building our roads to get through it as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. it, from my view, every you know, main street or, or central district to a city should track how many people entered and left without stopping. Mm -hmm. And everyone that did that is a policy failure. Yeah. Something wrong happened here because someone cut through this neighborhood and didn't stop because we're building it for a car to get through as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. If you're building it to walk through, to bike through, 
you're building it in a way now, even if you do want to pass through, you're interacting with it. Mm -hmm. You're stopping into something to do commerce. You're seeing a neighbor. You're observing the park. You're observing the art that's there. These are things that I, I think too too quickly we throw away as, as meaningless, right? Because you can't put it on a spreadsheet so easily. Uh, but this is the point of life. This is the point of a city. And I think that too often our policy forgets that, that really important fact. Yeah. Yeah. So Orlando is consistently rated the most dangerous city for pedestrians. And this prevents so much good things from happening to us. There are so many benefits to walkable communities. Like Hannah mentioned, there's community. You know, you have physical and uh, mental benefits. Not only that, like the built environment from walking around is so much happier. You get to see the town around you. If you drive, you see nothing, you know, it's a blur. So we want to make a walkable neighborhood where you know your neighbors and you can go to them for anything you need. And this type of community is really only built when you walk everywhere. If you drive everywhere, you don't see anyone. If you walk everywhere, you have the opportunity to meet your neighbors and create a sense of community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think to to that point, Nike, when there's a, a decent level of, of housing density in these yes. walkable neighborhoods, right. then you have, of course, more people in a smaller area. That's what density means. And so it's the same people doing the same yeah. thing over and over right. again. Mm -hmm. We live in a house that's way too expensive, that was overpriced, but we it's the only house we could find that our son could walk to each of his three schools mm -hmm. when he gets older. Because we want him to grow up near the students that he's going to go to school with mm -hmm. and to go to camp with the students and go play the park with the students he's going to go to school mm -hmm. with. This is such, this is a, a piece that I did not have that growing up. Mm -hmm. I lived in a suburb where everything was spread apart and I went to mm -hmm. a church with kids from other schools and I was in camps with kids from other schools and other sports from kids from other schools and everything was so separated and far apart and it, 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 it it's a, you know, it tears that fabric of a community apart. And so there's, there's the other aspects of this walkability to community is you have this neighborhood where these families are growing up together, they're mm -hmm. doing all sorts of their parts of life together, uh, and it just, it, it has this feedback cycle to it that I think is, mm -hmm. is again, hard to put in a, pr in a spreadsheet, but is really important in life. Yeah. I have to say that you specifically saying that as you were in your decision-making process of going for that walkability, and then you said that your house was overpriced, I think somebody <laughs> is profiting off of knowing that people are looking for that. Mm. People know that that is a mm -hmm. profitable marketing opportunity for that house so they can inflate the price because your house is not a mansion. It's a beautiful no, house, thanks, but, but it's just that three bedrooms. But it, it's just like, I think back in like 20 years ago, yeah. even that probably a teacher would have been just a single teacher probably would have been able to afford 100%. your house. Yeah. But through demand and through that market driving that demand and through uh, people trying to figure out here in our community like what the value of our housing market really is. It's that walkability. You have mm -hmm. a lot of beautiful tree coverage in your community. Yep. Uh, it's a quiet, slower roads in your community, right? Yep. And I feel like we're losing that, which is making homes that otherwise would have been affordable totally outside of affordability for the average worker here. I think it's, an imp it's important important um, time to answer the fact that as we talk about this, at least in my experience, the staff at cities and, and counties, they know this. They're, yeah, they know they way more know about planning this. than I could ever imagine to yep. know. It is not a, in my view, an expertise or planning problem. It is a political problem. It's, yeah. And the political problem that comes in there is in a neighbor in, in neighborhoods, I won't speak to mine specifically, but in neighborhoods in general, mm -hmm. um, neighbors know that they have that. and. I don't want to say they don't want others to have it too, but mm -hmm. they don't want that neighborhood to change mm -hmm. in a way that tangentially would allow other people to have it, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you start to allow greater density so that more people can enjoy those sorts of amenities, you're now changing what they view as the contract that they had to come into to say that this is my neighborhood, I moved here 25 years ago and it has to stay the same. Right. Now let's just chat a little bit because I feel like you kind of live in this like third kind of, you're not in the super, super urban area, but you're kind of more more in like that third, right before we get to that kind of more rural area. You still have walkable areas that have a great kind of um, 
uh, main street mm -hmm. where you're able to have that mixed use piece. When you went to a community meeting recently that was in a very similar neighborhood, you were anticipating some NIMBYs out there who really wanted that single family. They wanted to, mind you, because of property rights, most people aren't gonna be able to just fight a development and kill it. They're not really gonna have any options other than lower density. Lower density. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, like, the fight ends up becoming if we want to keep our roads safe and walkable, we've got to fight against this development and make it as low density as possible. And unfortunately, as much as we love you, you become a NIMBY <laughs> because you're fighting against the thing that we want here. We want even townhomes or duplexes here. It doesn't have to be a sky rise, but what usually is sold to a person is that your roads are going to be chaos. Right. Mm -hmm and you're gonna have higher crime rates, you're gonna have higher poverty issues because uh, homeless people are gonna come out of the woodworks now because they're all living in that little um, uh, forest. forest area that we're gonna develop and we're gonna just get rid of homelessness. What was your experience like when you went as a constituent at that community meeting trying to talk about EMBism? I'd like to just point out real quick, you said it briefly in passing, but you're exactly right. This happens at every single mm -hmm. conversation is the traffic. Traffic is what people always say to justify less density. And if we didn't have car-centric roads, traffic wouldn't be an issue. Yep. Exactly. If we it's had transit, all related. If we had sustainable transport bike lanes, we wouldn't need to drive everywhere. And if we didn't make them build parking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, I went to a community meeting recently, and the developer was proposing to develop a wilderness area all in single-family homes, huge lawns, luxury, unaffordable for working class, and no one wanted it, and their whole pitch was that they were removing the unhoused population that lived in the area, which I never saw myself. But their whole pitch was like, we gotta get these homeless people out. They're living in the forest. So like they had no consideration for housing these people. They just wanted to, you know, push them on to the next forest. Yeah, pretty they ironic. Didn't care about the community <laughs> overall. Um, Furthermore, like Austin said, he bought a house because it was walkable. Walkable communities like Baldwin Park, like New York City, like San Francisco, are the most essential places in the country because there are so few of them. There is a mis mismatch between supply and demand of the walkable communities that allow you to live a car-free lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So we are really just wanting to give what the people want. The people want more walkable communities, and that's what we're trying to give them. So mm -hmm. everyone, not just rich people. Right now, you can only afford to live in the walkable community. If you're wealthy, you can afford to live in Baldwin Park. We want, we think everyone. Or if you everyone, have four roommates. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you have four roommates. We want everyone to have access to these um, high amenity, walkable, bikeable communities. Not, you know, not just the wealthy. Mm -hmm. okay, I want to jump in something uh, you said, Naki, which is I love you call it these, these new single family homes luxury housing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of an aside, but one of my pet peeves is calling all you know, new apartments, new condos, luxury housing. Yeah. There's nothing more luxury than not sharing a wall with anybody and having a big lawn and a fence around your house. Luxury housing is what we are mostly zoned for, which is for folks to have their own house, and most people don't have that privilege. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just think that that terminology is, is, is an important one. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to talk about yeah. where our community is doing it right. Right, so you just said there's nothing more luxury than someone with a big lawn and like a fence and no mm -hmm. walls connecting them. In other parts of the world, in other parts of this country, people are using their properties better. I'll just give you two examples of where I've seen, where I've been inspired by urban design. Um, over in Italy, I studied in Italy for a year and I have a host family that I lived with. Very, very rural, little community, less than 2,000 people living in this area, but they designed their entire community so that you eat and play and grow and age all in the same place. So mm -hmm. the, the, the single family homes that we have now are not the same over there. They have two, sometimes three stories where your cousins, your grandma, right. and your new young mm -hmm. family that just got married all live and co you know coexist 
with the big garden that you're eating off of with your goats or chickens or what have you and then you are sharing that food with your neighbor who's also making wine and growing their garden and then their families watching your kids and your senior elder family members are walking and having fun and so there's no expensive um, uh, senior housing facility that you have to save your whole mm -hmm. mature life for to put your parents away when they become past right. an age that you can take care of them because the whole community is designed to take care of every family member at every level. I remember walking down Main Street, which we would do at 10 o'clock at night because people would take a midday nap and see little <laughs> kids in diapers running around at 1030 at night and I would say, where are these kids' parents? And my host brother would say, we're all those kids' parents. And I would say, well, where's the rapists and murderers and blah, blah, blah? Where are all those people? And they said, well, we only have alcoholics and they're all at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the way the community was designed is that, you know, you have everybody's mom and pop business that has been in their, their homes for generations or on the first floor. And then you have two floors of the family that's running the mom and pop business. And then their parents are on the top floor. Everyone's doors are open and everyone's watching each other. And it's just, everyone knows each other, which has its pros and cons, don't get me wrong. Um, now that's a small community. I recently went to Atlanta where I am like, oh, I love being in rural communities. I love just like not hearing a single car or like seeing people. I just love nature so much. But I fell in love with that city because it felt like every single ounce of space was utilized well. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. It still definitely has its problems, but God, there were so many trees. Public transit was on point. I'm sure it can improve. <laughs> compared oh to what I've been experiencing here, it was definitely leaps and bounds beyond what we have. And it just felt like there was, if I just spent my time vacationing on two blocks, I wouldn't have been able to see everything during my stay there because there's so much going on. And then the housing is just above it. So it's not even kind of in the way it's, commerce part everywhere and then housing yeah. is above and a part of it I, you know it's fun. I, I bet you a lot of people might be watching this and saying okay but i don't want that i yeah. want what i and i the response is okay but you're not letting anybody have it right but now. by saying no here that means mm -hmm. you're getting it here yeah. where it doesn't make any that's freaking exactly sense. how orlando is you know built well all our density is out in the sprawling areas like cimarron or metro west we have no density in our urban core which is a core fundamental problem of our all commuting we have no transit because we're sprawling doesn't make sense yeah, it doesn't make sense exactly but i would say even what folks might point to your horizons West, you're like, no, no, yeah. don't hold a candle to anything like what you're talking about, yeah. or Copenhagen, or Amsterdam. Like The level of, I think, what a lot of people really, really want, you can't find it. We've outlawed it. We've made it illegal here. Yeah. And so I think an important message that we talk about a lot mm -hmm. is that even when we say, this is an important point, even when we talk about getting rid of zoning that only allows single-family homes, doesn't mean banning single-family homes. Even Very when we important. say getting rid of parking minimums, doesn't mean banning parking. It just means, please stop forcing your lifestyle on us right? yeah. that's what it means and yeah. so I think that there's Probably opportunities right. for you know I think about the UCF area where right now it's a big a bunch of strip malls with Del Tacos and Chipotle's yeah I think about something like Fashion Square Mall Colonial Town Center maybe one day the executive airport these spots that are to some extent semi blank slates where maybe you could actually do something that some folks might think is a little bit radical but it's actually very common around the globe where you could build these really intensely walkable almost no cars mm -hmm. that makes sense in a, in a place but you, you can't it, it can be a difficult transition and so it's important to find spots that you can kind of jump start and do something special in mm -hmm. and there's opportunities in Orlando to do that but every couple decade or every decade those opportunities get fewer and fewer and fewer mm -hmm. because on a microcosm the small version of this is there's an empty plot of land in Orange County and we're only going to build single family homes. Mm -hmm. The opportunity cost of that is immense. Mm -hmm. I wish for every development that came in, we said, okay, we get this development, like a, a full 
cost-benefit analysis for everyone because it, it actually wouldn't take that much work. It sounds like it would, but if you look at the budget, it actually wouldn't because you have, okay, so here's this development. It's gonna, it's gonna bring in X amount in property revenue, but if we're gonna house all those people there, it's gonna cost Y amount in roads, schools, parks, fire, and police, mm -hmm. and everything else, water, utilities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And half people make decisions on that because yeah. the way that we decide these things is, is let's put people here. Mm -hmm. And and then the budget pieces are all separate and they're mm -hmm. piecemeal and they're yeah. harder for people to connect and so they compart I'm sorry people compartmentalize and they don't thread the needle through the whole mm -hmm. thing they don't yep. connect all the dots they just go okay let's house let's put a thousand units on the Lake County line because we need housing for everybody well mm -hmm. but where is it yeah you know yeah. <laughs> it's got to be where remember my hat <laughs> is off but I do work for the county. When you said that it's a Ponzi scheme, urban sprawl is a Ponzi scheme, I so feel that because when constituents call us concerned, we're like, mm. that's just the way it is. But when developers have a need, mm -hmm. it feels like we're like, yes, whatever we got to do to get this development going. Yes, you need a variance. You need to completely stray away from the comprehensive plan. We'll just make it work. We'll give you a and comprehensive then, plan amendment. And then <laughs> when you said we need a cost benefit analysis, there's a lot of costs that we're so far from ever quantifying, right? Wow. You're just talking about basic infrastructure needs. Mm -hmm. We're talking how many minutes does it take for a fire rescue to get to your house? Because right now we're developing things that takes 18 minutes minimum mm -hmm. to get there to rescue somebody whose house might be on fire. I'm talking about our quality of water, not just quantity, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of flooding issues, but I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about our water quality. How about our air quality? We're not quantifying that into a numerical value and then putting that cost somewhere, like on the developer. Instead, we're just like, 400 manatees died this year. There's a problem. Is there a solution? Nope, but we're going to approve 500 homes outside of our urban service area and just keep letting them pave everything and letting those people drive and contribute to a ton of runoff and just question it later when somebody actually is willing to pay for those solutions. It's like, well, it's the exact same thing as what we were talking about That's earlier right. with yeah. the housing, the poll, the like Seminole counties, yeah. where it's like, People say all the time in casual conversation, oh yeah, it's so crazy how these cities in the middle of nowhere that were in the middle of nowhere two, five years ago are growing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And then people say, oh, well, that's the only place that's cheap enough. And nobody connects mm -hmm. yeah. the land use decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the county's in a bind. I mean, you it all is. are facing these decisions where the, the solution, the, the options that you will have at the county level is this sprawl, or no housing, mm -hmm. right? because again, the municipalities are not playing the role in mm -hmm. building enough housing that would offset that. And so it's not an easy situation to be in unless the county wants to get on a bully pulpit and say, city, you have to build more housing because mm -hmm. we don't want to build further and further out, if that's a priority, which I don't know if necessarily mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. but in an ideal world, it would be. Well, let's talk about those unquantifiable costs, because you know me, I love to get deep. I don't want to just talk about the problems. I want to talk about the real, real problems, <laughs> right? Because we're sitting here and we're saying basically an equation that doesn't add up. We're talking about luxury housing going in everywhere. We're talking about the cost of, of our current system of transit, which is you have to be car dependent. What happens to our homeless? What happens to those people that buy a house out of a catalog and end up living in a sea of houses where they have to commute 45 minutes plus, which is two hours away from their family every single day where they're more isolated and and what does that do to our overall society and our overall environment just throw out whatever you guys want to chat about yeah. Uh, well, so, yeah, like go long, commuting co long commutes have a very negative effect on mental health um, so it's proven that biking, walking, and transit are positively correlated with improved health outcomes, not only mental, but physical. And we're forcing people to drive over an hour, which has 
uh, proven fact to increase risk of heart disease, mm -hmm. of all sorts of issues that could be avoided if we just built housing next to the jobs are. That's yeah. a big issue, the jobs housing imbalance. We need to build housing where the jobs are. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed to separated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, we're not giving the option. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, I feel very confident that if we build an extremely walkable, connected city, neighborhood, next, uh, to jobs. With, next to jobs in Orlando that had great walkability and transit connectivity, no parking because there was no cars and it was very walkable, uh, it would sell out immediately. It would probably be very expensive because it's what everybody wants. And so there's just no, um, there's there's, there's no option for it right now, and I think that that's what the biggest issue is. Um, you mentioned homelessness. Obviously, that's a, a very important one as well. Mm -hmm. Homelessness is a housing issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a coincidence that cities like San Francisco and New York that have the highest in gross terms, the highest um, housing prices, mm -hmm. have some of the highest populations of, of homeless um, because housing is expensive. And so when we make housing expensive, uh, people can't afford to live there, and it leads to, to, some, um, to some bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the hidden costs are so multifaceted. I mean, in, t in terms of like you were saying, roadkill and wildlife mortality, I mean, once again, it astounds me the lack of, or really the profound presence of cognitive dissonance in people. I mean, people say, oh wow, all of a sudden there are coyotes in my neighborhood. Kill and they them. don't think <laughs> about the fact that the coyotes lived there first, uh -huh. you know? They don't get that they are participating in habitat destruction and that's you know that's fine and that's not on them right because like you were saying lee i mean it's i tell lee this all the time but florida has always been in and is in the business of selling homes to people from out of state who are uninformed and it's messed up and i i think it's about time we had some freaking regulation on on somehow making sure that people when they move here know what they're getting because we see all the time like lee was saying people move into seas of houses my cousin moved to hollywood beach from new york city to raise her family <laughs> because she was like i need a single family home to raise my kid fine fine but you know what she misses the most the bodega she misses her corner store mm -hmm. because it's those little things where you see people in your neighborhood mm -hmm. and it changes the entire quality of life. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the disconnect between coyotes, wildlife, traffic and people, houselessness and housing and all these, all these things, prices of housing, until we connect those dots for people, you know, I don't, I don't think there's going to be the political will or the full realization of how those things are connected because I, I, I can't understand it because I feel like it's all I think about mm. and it's all mm -hmm. kind of all of us think about. Yeah. But I can't understand how people separate, you know, the decision makers separate the housing from the housing prices, mm -hmm. for example, or where the housing is being built from where people are working or mm -hmm. where there's transit and whatever. I mean, you know, so many places in Orlando are... Look at like Nona, for example. I moved here originally to Orlando in December to live with my partner, who at the time lived in Lake Nona, on the condition that we left Lake Nona. Because, sure, they have this is a great example they have a bike trail, it's 10 miles, but it's a bike trail for recreation. Yeah, don't go anywhere. And let me tell you, I rode it the other day and I had to cross the 417 twice. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Why the I'm sorry, I'm not crossing the 417. I tried and it was scary. I oh mean, God, no riding, I, and sure, I'm not crossing, I'm not crossing all whatever lanes, but just crossing the ramp, people pull up uh -huh. at 40 miles an hour on the ramp, fully expecting to fly into that right turn. Yeah. They're not looking for people. So sure, you have a 10 foot multi-use pathway, but if it's not being used to get to work, to improve people's physical and mental health, and it's there for decoration, it's useless, you know? Yeah. It, it, and I think, going back to your original question, to Lee, I think it's important, to, at least at least my perspective, is that the sort of spread outness and the autocentricity of it all is not, I don't think, the cause of this. Mm -hmm. I think it is a symptom of a larger cultural issue, right? Mm -hmm. Where where, you know, a sense of very strong individuality and a, a lack of desire to to necessarily even build those communities. I think that we could point to so many 
ills in our society that are all tied up in this, mm -hmm. that I don't think those things are caused by the fact that our cities are spread out. I think that our cities are spread out because of absolutely 100%. You know, I myself say that uh, urban sprawl is not, is not, God did not design the city of Orlando. People designed the city of Orlando. So there's no doubt that it is policy decisions and there's political pieces to it, but it's also part of, I think, just a larger cultural difference than places like Denmark and places like the Netherlands mm -hmm. um, that I think all of us want to see different, all sorts of different aspects of life. And those are all wound up together and why I think that there's a lot of mental health issues that come with this sort of way that we design our cities. Well, I don't know because we had a comprehensive plan that took all of this stuff into consideration, but it was corporate greed that came in that asked and applied for sometimes up to four to seven variances on one application when they're trying to put through their development that is completely against how we originally thought that community was going to look. And we trap people into circumstances mm -hmm. where we sell them that it's a quick drive over to the theme parks. You're gonna buy a house, it's gonna be the house of your dreams, it's gonna be just a, a hop, skip, and a jump over to some of the best restaurants. They forget to mention that you're only gonna be able to take toll roads. <laughs> yes, You're Poverty only tax. gonna be paying probably close to like $10 every two days minimum just to get Very to and from expensive. anything. Okay, um, or you're gonna have to suffer and spend over an hour commuting. Oh, and then they don't add that everywhere else is grossly growing, and it's usually a lot of times the same developers that know that they're screwing us in Orange County and all of our surrounding counties. And, you know, it, it puts us in a situation where everybody's mad all the time. So as soon as anything comes to a community meeting, people are against it. It's like, we. so I don't know, I would have to almost say that the culture is definitely different here, but it's specifically this way from failures because we've bent the knee to too many corporate private interests for too long. But but those but I guess I would say those developers are building the house the way that they are because the yeah. people want to buy it. Are you sure? They're buying because it. Because let me tell you, let me tell you. So that's the zoning. I think it's both. people want to buy it because they think that's the only safe accessible option because that's how it's been, right? Like like if they could afford if there were more townhouses, right? Because if you drive around a lot of times, people aren't, people that have single family homes with like lots of land, they're not really always taking care of their land. They're mm -hmm. not always trying to grow it and add trees and really prosper from no every inch. No one wants to take lawns. They're just mowing <laughs> it and it's just dead weeds and they're never outside. They just uh -huh. are buying it because they think this is a safe, quiet community and I want a safe, quiet community for my kids. They could have that in a condo or a townhouse or a mixed use house that has tons of public transit and they could have pocket parks everywhere if we designed it properly they could have a micro mobility and so they people don't know what they could have here i don't know i'm gonna get real for a second and i think it is the culture and i think something that we have to recognize is that pocket parks mean homeless people sleeping in the parks transit means people staying on transit all day you know and i think people are very afraid of that mm -hmm. and it's a very unfortunate reality and I, I think Austin's right that it's not car-centered design that built our cities it's that you know the policies are made around cars because we have to acknowledge you know and th this is something I'm very happy that the American Planning Association acknowledged during George Floyd and I think a lot of good has come out of the George Floyd protests including the fact that the American Planning Association has to answer for planners roles in in racist and classist zoning and yes. that's what exclusionary zoning is fundamentally mm -hmm. is it's racist yeah. and classist and that's part of our culture it's part of the individualism but I think fundamentally when you look at when cars started becoming more popular you know and and who was able to buy them mm -hmm. and who was using them and where they were going and where they were leaving 
mm-hmm. and where the they paved cities, the roads over. Mm-hmm. The cities were worker hubs. I mean, the best places we go today, right? Like Savannah, Georgia. Everybody loves Savannah because it was built before cars. Mm-hmm. New York City has put in so much work to undo the damage of Robert Moses. <laughs> because, <laughs> listen, I mean, I've been reading this book for way too long, but Robert Moses is the perfect Color example block. of a decision maker who built for cars explicitly for classism and racism. He built bridges that were too short for buses so mm-hmm. that the poor people couldn't go to Jones Beach and the playgrounds in the cities were cement. You know, I mean, those those things are deliberate and I think I think it's very, very important to acknowledge that it's, it's the culture and I think, th- hopefully this doesn't come out weird, but I think ethnic homogeneity in places like Denmark and Europe does make it easier because, you know, I think our diversity is the number one asset America will ever have. But I think recognizing who is able to participate in mm-hmm. the conversation mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. diversity puts us at a disadvantage in a lot of ways and that includes in the way that we build and plan because when you're coming from you know Denmark for example where everyone is kind of predisposed to be somewhat socialist all of them right like for generations people in Denmark have paid generally high taxes for social services there's a mutual understanding and I mean you see it now over the past 10 years as more and more refugees come into Europe all of a sudden there are a lot of racist undertones that are being exposed in parts of Europe that seem so great, liberal, and free yes. thinking. And it's the same undertones as the NIMBYism. And it's not that everyone who's a NIMBY is a racist, but I think it's really, really important to recognize the way that cars have facilitated very racist themes themes, and, and the way that we've built our cities. And, mm-hmm. and we see that in the arguments today when people say, oh, we don't want affordable housing near us because, crime. because of crime. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Do yeah. you think they're going to go into your house because they're poor? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, there's there's so many layers to that kind of egotistical um <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Well, I, 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 I get very frustrated, yeah, but it's the last It's thing. very important to know well, that, that racist things uh, and that the classism is there. That was 100% with <laughs> it you. It is there. <laughs> what about the Vision say. Road? Orlando has a road called the Vision, which literally segregated the white from the black community. Yeah. And you're telling me infrastructure is not racist? Well, I wanted to say, because we didn't get to our final thing, which was affordable housing. Affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> and it all this is all about. That's why I'm right because I wanted to dive in because I feel like affordable housing is its own thing. Housing is a human right. That's what we're It is. I have to say that I'm learning in this role (laughs) and in working with organizations that their whole focus is helping people with disabilities and people with mental health disorders and people who are homeless actually find their way to prosperity. Affordable housing doesn't necessarily mean affordable to people who are below a certain tier, right? And we have to kind of really define the language even amongst, I think, the YIMBY movement, right? Because affordable housing for some reason has like a connotation of you're going to bring more crime, you're going to bring more people who aren't like me into my community and there's a lot of fear there. But then there's also affordable housing can be very limited in terms of affordable for who, Mm -hmm. right? Because there are even people who are working at our theme parks who can't even afford affordable housing that have to live in motels or in their cars just to be able to make it on the salaries of what they're given here in our community. So let's close up a little bit on affordable housing. Yeah, so affordable housing is a complicated subject. There's a lot of different terms for it, depending on your average median income. Um, for us, we are talking about people who make below median income. And unfortunately, in Orlando, that's based on the overall region and not on neighborhood. So a neighborhood like Paramore will have affordable housing built upon median incomes for the overall county, but people who live in Paramore cannot afford to buy those affordable housings like you mentioned. So that's why there has to be a conversation with the community about what the actual community needs Mm -hmm. and what income levels need to be supported. You know, over it's a lack of funding, of course, Mm -hmm. Um, and Orange County has made some great steps with their affordable housing trust fund, which the city needs to follow. But like you said, there's a lot of bad connotations and it's a cultural thing. We need to change that culture and say that 
we want more neighbors. We want affordable housing in our backyard. Yeah. Yeah, I won't break any news by pointing out that it's a very holistic problem, right? It's not, it's the housing, it's also the transit, it's mm -hmm. the uh, affording a car if you need a car, uh, it's healthcare, there's all sorts of things that go into it. It's the specific neighborhood that would determine uh, whether housing is truly affordable and, and for whom and what's the context and where they're trying to get to. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. I think one thing, well, one, Nucky's right. I, I, always my answer to this is funding. Funding, funding, funding. I mean, if you're not providing funding to it, um, it's, there's no way to make it work. The reality is that we have private home builders who build private housing, and they need to make the dollars work. And if they're not going to build it here, because uh, it doesn't make financial sense, they'll just go to Tampa and they'll build yeah. it, or they'll just go to Miami and they'll build it. And so the way Poor that we County. can help, or Polk County, the way that we can help them make it sense is through something called gap financing, which is when a city your county brings forward funding to help make bridge that gap and make it make financial sense for the private builder to build a housing that serves a public service for, for folks who make yeah. lower income. I, I'm, a, I'm a, a growing fan, I'm still learning about it, but this concept of, of social housing where it's, uh, it's fully sort of public, uh, but there's mixed income levels within it. Mm -hmm. And so in this sense, you know, I would be purchaser renting a public unit even though I'm purchasing it at market rate. And my rent is subsidizing that submarket rate housing for lower income folks. And the reason I like this is because it takes the stigma out of mm -hmm. living in public housing, right? Mm -hmm. If now it's, it's multiple different income levels who are living there, you don't, you have this same exact unit as everybody else. You don't know what they're paying for rent. It's not your business. They're paying it based on their income level. Yeah. I think that sort of helps with the social cohesion side of it and takes the stigma out of it. It's a model that isn't really prevalent in the United States, but it is common elsewhere, especially in Europe. And I think that something like that uh, would need some federal laws changed to make it happen. But I think that something like that could, could help. In the meantime, before all that happens, uh, we, we need funding and we need it from, from city and county. We need funding and then we need political will and then we need accountability mm -hmm. for those different income level complexes to make sure that a certain percentage is staying affordable so that mm -hmm. they can't go after federal support or subsidized support and then turn around and end up catering to that above market rate yeah. clientele anyway, right? Yeah. And and at the end of the day though, you know, I always am wondering like what are some of the solutions right now that are right at our fingertips? Like educating people, I feel, right off the bat is like the quickest way. What you guys are doing with Orlando Yimby is one of the fastest ways to, to make people say, like I, I had neighbors here and I live in a single family community and I'm trying to really help because right around the corner, we have the highest concentration of families in these motels, we have over 2,000 families no. living in the six motels that are right here in the corner of Lee Road and I-4 um, that are also changing out their time living in their hotels with people who are living in their cars in the parking lot so that they can get showers for their kids, okay? so. We're at talking crisis level need, and even then, they're paying about sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars a month for the motel. Okay, so so and but these are people who have, you know, maybe they're ex convicted felons, maybe they have been evicted at some point, maybe they don't have IDs because they're not citizens, maybe they, these are all have individual stories, but we're not really catering at all. They're kind of, they fall through the cracks of this conversation of affordable housing because there's such a need for people who are working two or three jobs at that, Yeah, uh, this know? is I'll come back to. It's like we have the, the programs and services to serve them. They're just not robust enough. They're yeah. not highly funded enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, 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 would, I would love to see, um, because I know we're putting, putting a certain amount of money into our general revenue. We're pulling a certain amount of money from general revenue and spending it on the affordable housing trust fund. I would, they should start to publicize what that number is, and whenever a market rate unit is developed, uh, quantify that on how much that's going to go into the affordable housing trust fund and how much is going to go to funding affordable housing. Because again, it comes back to one of the earliest points I made, right, which is that building commerce, building housing, 
builds up our general revenue and we can use that to fund affordable housing. Right. To me, that, that continues to just be the, 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 biggest, the biggest problem. It's why we are searching for other pools of funds that we can pull from because the, the way that we're going to solve it, there's a lot of ways, you know, there's, there's a cultural, there's nonprofit role. Um, it, it cannot be, be done without more public dollars from federal, from state, mm -hmm. and certainly from county and well, city. I'm curious about when people say, oh, but my property value is going to go down. I'm like, well, is it? From what? Oh, from... from yeah, like our, my neighbors were saying, oh, a duplex was going to go in, but it was going to affect all of our property values. I'm like... Well, look, I mean... What? T we have to... We, th here's another uncomfortable truth, is either property values go... When property values go up, housing gets less expensive. Yeah, pay it's more math. taxes. Yeah. It, I, it, when house, so when, when property values went up by 20% in the last year, Okay, property values went up. That also means that housing became less affordable by 20% in the last yeah. year. So uh, will, will property values go down? I, I don't know. Uh, if they do, that just made housing more affordable. Yeah. And so we do have to grapple with that. Again, it's an uncomfortable truth yeah. is that I just saw, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the president, but there was a statement out there that he was sort of celebrating that people's home prices have gone up, right? We're, we celebrate yeah, we're, that. We're feeding we celebrate that. But, like, but when we celebrate that home prices have gone up, what we're celebrating is a, a lack of affordability of housing. And so uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know, it, it's complicated and it's not easy and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, but um, we gotta get the conversation yeah. out there, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's the paradox. Like yeah, that's a good word for it. can't be a good investment and also affordable. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, honestly, that just feels like to me, just another example of classism in that way because economies always have booms and busts. Your housing values are always going to go up and they're always going to fall. Yeah. Sometimes it's better for you and sometimes it's worse for you. And that's a fact of life and to mm -hmm. put that onto or make that into a reason to reject somebody else's opportunity to share in the joy of your neighborhood at an affordable price is ridiculous. And I think in terms of affordability, it's something else to mention is what affordability does mean and, and how we achieve it. I think lately there's been a lot of conversation about just increasing the housing stock improves affordability, which I think to some degree is true. But I think in a lot of ways, developers kind of exploit that and just say, we're gonna be building affordable housing because they're building more housing, but it's not actually affordable to the average person. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from a governmental perspective, defining affordability and holding ourselves as decision makers and our, ourselves as neighbors, as decision makers, who can influence whether or not something builds more or less density, mm -hmm. it's important to recognize, you know, what does affordability actually mean? Because it's thrown around as an insult and it's thrown around as praise. And mm -hmm. both times we never we never mean, are we targeting a per certain percent of the area median income like Nucky said? Are we giving low income housing tax credits? Are we just doing below market rate without any accountability? Or is it just market rate and we're just hoping that the market rate will go down with more of it? Mm -hmm. Because frankly, I think a lot of times it's the last, it's the last one. And are we going out of our way to make sure that the most vulnerable mm -hmm. parts of our community are actually getting the first uh, opportunities to get into affordable housing mm -hmm. with wraparound services so that they can stay in sustainable situations? I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. But in closing, let's talk about solutions. So what group should people be a part of and plug your shit? <laughs> Orlando Yimby. Okay, right. so where at can Orlando, they get involved? At Orlando Yimby on Twitter, on Facebook, <laughs> on Twitter, we're, on Twitter we're pretty aesthetic. <laughs> uh, we're much we're much softer on Facebook. Orlando Yimby on Facebook. Orlando www.orlandoyimby.org. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on Instagram at Orlando Yimby. Mm -hmm. uh, check us out. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few ways to get involved. You can join our newsletter, see what's going on, or you can join as a volunteer. Uh, we don't have membership dues. We don't. We have a budget of zero dollars. So you join as a member, or excuse me, as a volunteer. You donate your time and your energy, uh, and then we'll get you connected into our little Slack channel that we all have going, where we we, we plan our, our events and our and our advocacy. Uh, yeah, there's there's plenty of ways to get involved. Can also join Orlando Bike Coalition if you care about transportation, equity, and infrastructure. Um, you know, just something to chew on is when you see people on bikes in downtown Orlando and whether or not they're doing tricks on bikes, for example. Um, I think it'll be interesting to know how you react 
to their use of the bike mm -hmm. and if it's obvious if that person is commuting by choice or by necessity. Um, so I think that's just a part of the conversation in terms of transportation equity. And you can follow Orlando Bike Coalition at orlandobikes.org and at Orlando Bike Co on Twitter and Orlando Bike Coalition on Facebook. We are advocating for world-class infrastructure for bikes in the city of Orlando. Like Lee said, we're one of the most dangerous cities in the country for bikes. And we have so much opportunity to improve that in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it would be beneficial to the city of Orlando as well. We have so much to offer and people don't see it when they're all driving through. So, but they see it when they bike. That's so follow true. us um, and get involved and we'd be happy to include you. Let's hear about your shirt. Yeah, okay, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> uh, so I don't know about the Republicans, what they're doing, but apparently the Bernie books. <laughs> they don't want, hey, they don't want Judy Bloom teaching your <laughs> children about uh, slavery or sex, so they're like, burn that book, cancel that author, no cancel cultural. So, anyways, it's pretty well, much like Orwell. He's gonna pull a knife. Unrelated to anything. Um, like Hannah said, you should join Orlando Bike Coalition. You should join Orlando Yimby. For sure. We are a holistic sure. community of people that care about not just housing, we care about transportation. You know, we care about making everyone welcome. We want to make Orlando a city for everyone. The most livable city in the country. There you go. City beautiful. beautiful. City beautiful, make the city bikeable. We want you to be our neighbor. Yeah, and because I'm super passionate about um, homelessness, uh, tomorrow I will be doing a supply drive uh, and at Matthew's Hope, which is an incredible organization that helps people on the front lines of poverty. Um, living in camps, the like same camps that you're being fear-mongered when you're told that your community is going to have tons of crime and homelessness issues if you don't have this single-family complex in your neighborhood. The thing is, is that homelessness is affecting people everywhere, every single corner of our county, and that we need to be responsible for each other and do what we can do to bring supplies and funding to the organizations that are really gonna help every single person individually because their voices need to be heard just as much as ours. Um, so Matthew's Hope, check them out, matthewshopeministries.org. And thank you all so much thank for you. being my honored thank guest. You. Seriously, really thank you. Thank you guys so good. much. This was good. We should and do this again. This was really therapeutic. This should be I, weekly. Think, <laughs> I mean, I have notes here that we didn't cover, but we were running yeah, a little so long. So it seems like we're going to have to do a part two and probably dive even deeper into transit. A burn book club, maybe. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. I am just so grateful for those of you who tuned in, even for a small portion of this, because you have the ability to make a difference every single day. And if you don't believe it, talk to somebody who loves you and ask them if you guys can work together and maybe come and volunteer and be a part of a group like the ones mentioned today. And I love you and I thank you and I respect you and value your time. Thank you.